All right, welcome everyone. Really happy to have you here. Uh, I'm Danielle Kurtzleben. I am a political correspondent for NPR, but also in my spare time, uh, I review books for NPR and sometimes for the Washington Post. And that is enough about me because we are here to talk about Total, which is a new collection of short stories by Rebecca Miller. She is a short story writer, a novelist, a filmmaker. She is one of those multi-hyphenate people who is ridiculously talented. And I'm gonna leave it to her to introduce herself a little more. Hello. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I, I started writing fiction very early on, but didn't ever think I would publish it. Um, I was writing my short stories thinking I was trying to find my films, the short films that I was making, and uh, gradually realized that you know, rather than throwing them away, I could really start to train myself and learn how to write fiction, and that took a number of years. And But then, since then, I've written short stories and novels and made films kind of like in a rotating way and, and sometimes adapted my work um, from fiction to film. In the case of Personal Velocity and the case of uh, The Private Lives of Pippa Lee. And in fact, right now, uh, I'm finishing a film called She Came to Me, which is sort of inspired by one of the stories in this collection called She Came to Me, but very loosely. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of, I don't know, I've just, I, I guess partly I, I started writing fiction because I could, you know, it became impossible to get money for films, and then I really, you know, my, I started trying to publish fiction, rather. I had already been writing it. So that was sort of my story, was that, that you know, it was a way of not going insane and starting to, like, keep telling stories, because I'm very much a storyteller, and it was a way for me to... And then, amazingly, I was able to be published, and people were interested in what I was writing, and so on. But, um, it, you know, it's like, I guess you could just people just keep reinventing themselves as they go along, and that's what I've done. All right, and before we get into questions and answers today, uh, we thought it would be good for Rebecca to read us an excerpt, and she has yeah. prepared one. So I should explain that this, this collection, um, I, th this, this first story was written actually when I was, uh, had a, my, last, my youngest baby, who is now 20. Um, and the collection really has a big chunk of the flesh of my life in it. Um, not that it's autobiographical, but that the things that I was thinking about and um, my concerns are very much reflected in the book. And I sometimes feel like it's like a bridge to my younger self. So sometimes it's interesting because I almost, it's not that I don't recognize the person, because in some cases I had to finish the stories much later. Like recently during the pandemic, I finished some of the stories, which I didn't know how to write back in the day that when I started them. Um, this, this story was actually uh, one of the earlier, not the earliest, but one of the earlier ones that I began. And um, I'll just read a little bit and explain a little bit between the passages so you can understand what's going on. So this is called Mrs. Covet. It started with the ladybugs. The first one was a promise of luck on a spring day as I folded towels in the kids' bathroom. The shiny little bubble moved clumsily up the mirror, seemed actually to waddle in her red armor with its cheerful yellow spots. Ladybug, ladybug, fly away home. Your children are crying. Your house is on fire. What's lucky about that? I leaned over and put a finger up to her. She crawled up on it. I wondered. Are you supposed to make a wish? So then we get to know Daphne a little bit. She's pregnant. She has two other kids. Um, and uh, she talks. She, there's a whole big stream of consciousness bit, which we're skipping. OK. About a week after I saw the first ladybug, I noticed there were five of them in the boys' bathroom, two in the sink, one in the bathtub, two crawling around the, on the mirror. Days after that, I was reading Tyler a story in his bed when one of them dropped onto my cheek. It panicked me. I shrieked. I never knew they could fly. They land clumsily, stupidly, and when it's time to take off, they push a little secret pair of wings out from under their shells. Within a month, I had counted 35 ladybugs in the boys' bathroom alone. 
Then I started finding them in the bedrooms, our bathroom, the closets. They were flying more and more. And one day, one of them was zooming around in crazy circles and it bit me in the back of the leg. It was an invasion. I started to think they were evil. But you can't kill a ladybug. It's terrible luck to kill a ladybug. I started spending more and more time out of the house. Once I dropped the boys at school, I stayed out, got a cup of decaf, went food shopping, even went to a matinee a couple of times. Then I would pick up Tyler from nursery school and we'd go out to an early lunch. The house was becoming a mess. Orange peels under the beds, grime in the toilet bowl. Craig tried to be nice about it. He knows how I get when I'm pregnant. It's hard to describe what happens. It's as though all the walls in my mind slide down like car windows and the thoughts just float freely around my brain. I, found, I find socks in the freezer, notebooks in the linen closet. I once showed up two days late to the dentist. At least I got the time right. But the ladybugs were threatening to be a real problem. I couldn't sleep, I didn't want to be in the house, and I wouldn't let Craig get an exterminator. One night, we were sitting at the kitchen table after dinner. Craig watched as one of the creatures crawled along the edge of a bowl filled with coagulating breakfast cereal. Then he said, if you need help with the house, I'll get you someone. I'll ask my mother. I burst into tears. I'm not sure if it was relief or a premonition. The very next day at 9 a.m., my mother-in-law, Carol Rice, drove up in her new Chevy Impala. She was dressed in baby blue, ironed slacks, matching blue sweater with shoulder pads in it. Her white blonde hair had even taken on a bluish cast. Still in Craig's pajamas, I watched her through the window, my belly pressing against the glass as she got out of the car, primly brushing imaginary crumbs from her bust and walked around to the other side. The passenger, the passenger door opened with ominous slowness. I saw one hand grip the side of the door frame. A dark head appeared, then swung out of view. A moment passed. Suddenly, an enormous woman heaved herself out of the low car and unfolded herself with difficulty. She must have been six feet tall. Short dark hair, athletic build, breasts the size of watermelons. Carrie, Carol came up to her shoulder. The two of them strode up to the house. Carol opened the door with a perfunctory knock, calling, Daphne, in her high sing-song voice. Hi, Carol, I said. My underarms were sweating, my teeth were unbrushed, my hair was snarled. Carol looked, Carol looked, at me, up, looked me up and down and sighed. She'd had six kids and I doubt she'd let herself look like this for one single morning. Honey, this is Nat. She's gonna get your life in order. The enormous woman towered over me. Her eyes were a light piercing green. Her massive chin seemed clamped onto the rest of her face by a fierce underbite. She was wearing a vast sweatsuit the color of concrete. I hear you need a little help with the house, she said. And anyway, things go from bad to worse, let's just say that. <laughs> so I wanted to start by asking, first of all, I, this story I particularly loved out of all of these. Uh, but it, it, this story really gets at the theme of motherhood, which is something that pops up a lot in this story collection. And from a lot of angles, people dissatisfied with their mothers, people having difficulty being mothers. I'm curious, why is this such a rich theme for you in, in your writing? I don't know. I think probably family is the thing that I uh, understand the best as a writer. Um, whether it's daughterhood, motherhood, being, you know, I have three sons. You know, my keenest memories of, is a family. I think I'm an empathic person very much, so I understand what people are feeling a lot, which is not always the best situation. Um, and so I was, you know, it, it came, it happened naturally. I mean, these, like I said, these stories were really written over a long period of time and they were published in different publications. And then I, and some of them weren't published at all. And I, and I created them later recently. And, but, but there was this kind of like, in most of the stories, not all of them, um, there is a mother child element. Um, and it's not always like, a warm and fuzzy sort of situation, but nor is it always horrible. I think it's about the power of that relationship and the, you know, just the intense power of it and um, how that can be, 
you know, like an egg or something, you, you open it and, and there's, you know, a lot comes out, you know, the, it's like Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. it, I like that you talked about the, that it's never a perfect, warm, fuzzy, soft focus relationship, nor is it always horrible. I, what I, one thing I appreciated about your book is that the, the voice that you write in, because it is certainly not sentimental, but it's also not detached and ironic. It's, uh, fi finding that line, I think, is ve must be very difficult as a writer. How would you describe the voice that you write in? Well, I think it, you know, I'm very much about character and trying to find out like what's a who's the character and how are they talking and how would they talk? And I guess to some degree, of course, I as a character am in there somewhere, but you know, it's like I try to Im inhabit characters as much as I can as a writer and uh, it's important to me, like, there is a lot of humor in the book, but at the same time, it's important that it isn't, like, really satire in the sense, because I think satire has a lot of distance. Right. Whereas I think where I am is sort of always pulsing between more distance and then really, you know, going in and, and allowing for emotion. What I try to avoid is sentimentality, um, which I don't like very much. Right. Uh, that may be the perfect setup to talk about your title story, Total, uh, which, speaking of satire versus not, I mean, this is a story that starts off, you, I was reading it and I thought, oh, this is a heck of a sci-fi story about our obsession with technology, because to set this up for the audience, uh, it's a short story set in a world not so unlike ours, where a company makes phones called Total Phones, and they are phones that are so enjoyable and addictive that they kind of ruin people's lives, <laughs> and, um, and furthermore, to that end, they cause some really terrible birth defects in some of the women that use them, and these are called total children, uh, they come to be known as. But the story, it starts off talking about this, but it ends up becoming a family drama as a teen girl rescues her sister, who has these birth defects, from a care facility, and what we see is just sort of a road story of them being on the run, and I'm wondering, I found myself wondering, tell me about the dystopic frame that you put on a family drama. Why, why did those work together for you? I have to admit, there's some stories that are like a mystery even to oneself as a writer. And that particular story, I really can't tell you too much about where <laughs> it came from. I was, um, you know, I was a painter when I started out. That's what I was trained as. And I had this cycle of dreams that I painted from a lot. There were these babies that had a lot of them, often they had these triangular sort of rocky kind of heads. And it, that was very much the model for the children with the total syndrome. So in a sense, it was like going back to this very early thing that I had been interested in and obsessed with when I was younger. But also, um, I think I needed, I needed to go into the future slightly to lift to just li to, to to make it possible to tell the story, I couldn't really tell the story of the total of this of the. I, I couldn't do it. I felt in the present, and I've never had that experience before. I've never written anything that was science fiction, and I never probably will again. But it was just, um, it was it seemed necessary, and it came in a very unconscious way. I was we lived in Ireland at that time, and um, I found myself just taking notes in a little notebook, and I took notes for couple of years and the story kind of like just was not the whole thing was dictated to me but I just kept hearing these lines and you'll see if you read the story it's it's kind of written in this other way this were like there are a lot of like individual lines and it's quite airy in between and and then you get into these dense passages so yeah it's a combination isn't it of like sort of sci-fi but then also really uh, it's about the relationship with this girl and her mother and um, her rage at her mother, and but at the same time, she finds that perhaps her motivation for rescuing her sister is darker than she thought. Yeah. Uh, the, one thing I did want to ask you about is, yes, you have this main character, a teenage girl who is rescuing, as she thinks, rescuing her sister, and she's this teenage girl is also quite angry at her mother, and I'm wondering, when you have characters in conflict, like that, especially when your protagonist is really angry at someone else in the story. 
How, how much empathy do you have for your characters, even the characters who are behaving badly or questionably in your stories? I think I always have empathy um, for my characters. It's the only way I can write them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not saying that they always come off very well, I mean, as, as characters. I mean, they don't care. But, but I, I like them enough to write about them. I, I've never written about someone who is purely evil um, or completely without conflict. Like, the minute somebody has conflict, they have goodness, right? Because, like, it's both. And I think that that is very interesting to me, the way that um, people can be doing something really not good and yet also have, you know, have the desire to be good or the, the, even sometimes the feeling that they're doing good. You know, that, that's how most bad things get done. They don't get done by people who think they're doing the wrong thing. Right, that's very fair. <laughs> um, I want to, we have a lot of stories and I really enjoyed so many of them, so I want to make sure we touch on a few more. Um, it, the stories we've talked about so far, Mrs. Covet and Total, both uh, are a piece with the rest of the book because they have a sort of turn in them where you suddenly understand, oh, this is what the story is about, or oh, this just uh, went from bad to worse. Uh, that's interesting. And there's another story in here called Vapor, where a woman runs into an ex, it turns out a pretty bad ex, but what the story becomes is a sort of retelling of not just how she met him, but of, of many past relationships of hers. We sort of get a tour of her romantic past. And as I was reading it, I found myself going, oh, this is what this is about. All right, let, I'm, I'm here for it. And I'm wondering, as you're writing, are you thinking about the reader and thinking, I'm going to surprise the reader here? Or is it more just, I'm going to write what's on my soul and the reader can feel however they feel well, about Well, I think it's back and forth. That's a really interesting question. I think on the one hand, like in that, in Vapors, I had this sense that I knew what, the, I, I knew what the big gush was, like the stuff, you know, it's like somebody like nicks an artery and all the blood comes out. I knew that it was going to be about this thing where like just blah, all this stuff happens. But I was like, how is it, how, what's the frame? And it wasn't until much later that I found the frame, mm -hmm. which is meeting the old boyfriend, right. and that that brings it all back. Um, but in a case like, um, there's another story called I Want You to Know, which is right. really my Ed Edgar Allan Poe um, homage, <laughs> kind of, um, sort of about, and there, it's, it's about something horrible that a woman finds out when she's renovating a desk that she finds in, in her new house that, that's an old farmhouse, but it, she recently bought this old farmhouse and she renovates the desk and inside is this horrible letter. I carried around the horrible letter for years thinking this was the story. And then I realized, no, it isn't the story. It's a story inside the story. So sometimes it takes me a really long time to understand even what I'm even writing, you know, because I just, I, I think for me, like some people are much faster. I don't think I'm a very fast writer. It takes me sometimes a very long time, maybe because I work quite unconsciously, and then it takes me a long time to catch up with, um, with, with my unconscious. My conscious mind has to catch up. Mm -hmm. With I want you to know, uh, you, right, you have the letter or the story that the woman finds in the desk, and then the story of her finding that in the desk. And I. When you say that you started with that internal story and you didn't have the frame story yet, how did you know that the internal story needed a frame story? Well, because I couldn't make it work. I couldn't figure it out. Like, it was so raw. And it was so raw and um, so brutal. And um, it was like, I, it, it needed to be really raw and brutal and kind of just almost vomited in a way, but, but I couldn't then turn it into a story. It just was this thing. It was like a found object. I don't know. I just, and, then, and then there was a scene, um, you know, when the lady of the house, and the, the, there's a big um, manor house on the edge of this Hudson that these two farming young people, organic farmers, are invited, and this woman her dog is very overexcited, and to calm the dog down, she masturbates the dog, just matter-of-factly, while talking to this couple. And that was something that... It's a beautiful old, moment, yeah. It's a beautiful, very heartwarming. <laughs> but um, 
the, but the funny thing is that that is a story that a boyfriend of mine had told me had happened. Like he had seen this woman do that. And I would, for years, I was like, I've got to find something. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, maybe I could. So, you know, funny it's how you bring it all together somehow. <laughs> I think that's the first time anyone's ever used the phrase masturbated a dog in an interview. Yeah, it's, it's an unusual no, practice. It, but. Um, but I want you to know, and Vapors both also deal, speaking of themes that run throughout this book, and there's a lot, but with, sort of with the, with, with the tension of, between reality and fiction. In Vapor, it's more subtle, but there's a line in it where the person, the protagonist says, why bother feeling so much in life if all of it turns to vapor? And it's a, both this and the end, um, I want you to know, seem to deal with emotional reactions and how real they are, sort of. Is, is that a fair read of those stories? Well, I think, I mean, I guess, you know, I want you to know is a lot about perception mm -hmm. and how you perceive things to be one way and then you're given more information and your brain transforms it. It's like you're constantly, we're constantly reassessing each other and reassessing situations. Um, so I don't know if that's what you mean. I'm not sure I know what you mean exactly. Well, so I, I in part, I'm afraid to give away all of I want you to know. I yeah, yeah, yeah. The audience should read it. But I... I think what I'm wondering about is, I want you to know very much is about the power of a story to really affect someone, to really haunt someone. Oh, yes. Yes. And um, it's, a, well, to some degree, it's about the power of writing and reading and how strange it is to read. And, you know, it, I mean, partly it's because she reads this letter and she has a completely different idea of her house. She suddenly realizes that there's been this horrible murder in the house. And so she kind of sees the house in a completely different way. And then she meets the woman that I was just describing, and that woman puts it in yet another, like actually twists it around like, and says, oh, but this is what it really is. And so, but then she's left with what the letter gave her because once you read something, it's in your brain and it's very hard to get it out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so in that sense, it's kind of about the strange power of reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to get to another story in the book, She Came to Me, which you mentioned already. And it's the only story that is written from the point of view of a male protagonist. And I was wondering, do you how, how different do you find it to write men versus women? Is one harder or not? Or is it, how do you think about that? Um, I think I probably, I mean, I, I definitely have like, you know, lots of characters knocking on the door of my head. And most of them are definitely female. But there are sometimes men that I get to, you know, get the gift of. And he was definitely, Kieran was definitely one of those guys. Um, and I've written for male characters in film, um, like main characters a couple of times. And I only do it when I can, re and, one, and a novel, um, Jacob's Folly is, is got a male protag protagonist. I think that they come as strongly and as, as with as much vigor as the female characters, but, um, but more rarely. Partly because I find women so very fascinating and 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 kind of I don't know just multi-layered um, and mysterious. Not that I don't feel that way about men, but strangely a little bit less so. Perhaps I don't know. I don't know what what it is exactly. I mean, maybe because I'm female. I guess that's an answer. <laughs> We're pretty mysterious and fascinating. <laughs> I think. I mean, personal opinion. Um, Speaking of the differences that you seem to write between men and women, at least in the sample size we have here, one thing I noticed is that your women characters are very aware of their bodies, like aware of the effects their bodies have on people around them, especially men, aware of, you know, one character's pregnant body. You, you write a... Yeah. One of the best descriptions of puberty that I've read <laughs> of this teenage girl who suddenly has this unwieldy mass that she has to carry around and is just not used to. I mean, yeah. is, it, it, I wonder, is that something, is that a uniquely female issue or is that just something that we all deal with? Well, I do think that there is something particular about the experience of, of, of acquiring a female body in puberty suddenly, and it is, a, depending on what body you end up with, is like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
it can be very confusing, especially if you're very young. And it, I, I had a friend who had a, the situation of having been, become developed very, very early and very, you know, dramatically. And she talked a little bit about that. And I was, I was just really interested in that idea of like the body and how it, how you have to catch up with your body. I mean, all of life is about catching up. Like, I feel like I'm still catching up with how old I am now. Like, I'm, I'm still confused. Like, you know, I think that we, or my children, I still think they're like five years younger than they actually are. So it's kind of like everything is, you know, moving ahead and we're trying to catch up. And I think puberty in particular is a moment where you're like, you know, you were a child five minutes ago and mm -hmm. suddenly you're not. And, um, but yeah, I think that inhabiting your body and the experience of having a body and is all a big part of writing to me. Like writing is a very sensual thing for me, very image heavy and very sensual and s about senses, the senses. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to ask you a broader question, because you've mentioned a few things about writing today, about characters knocking on the door of your brain, about writing being sensual, about being a sort of um, subconscious writer. I'm curious about your, uh, your writing process. Do you have, uh, is it a thing where you sit down every day and like you're, is it a discipline sort of thing or is it a wait for the stories to come to you? How, how do you go about writing your stories? Well, when I'm in a kind of a writing mode, I am very disciplined to start in the morning and I write. And I usually read what I wrote the day before and then rewrite some of that and then write some more. And when I've written novels, I try to write like three pages a day. Just, it's just because if you, it just, I found myself, if I was able to do that, even if, even if I could only write, you know, knowing that parts of it were going to be completely rewritten, it would keep me on track because otherwise I found it really overwhelming. But, um, I mean, I have had period, one period particularly of complete writer's block, which was a nightmare. Um, but generally, you know, what is the most easy for me is that I have a lot of characters that come to me, mm -hmm. you know. And then finding form for those characters and finding a way to clothe their concerns and their, their inner life with action that is taken from who they are is like, that's the work. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Gotcha. Uh, well, I don't want to monopolize everything here. I know that we uh, have a question and answer portion. So if you have questions, uh, it looks like we have two mics here. So by all means, don't be shy. book yet, but could you tell me about the cover? The cover? Yes. Well, the cover was, you know, designed by our wonderful, this wonderful designer at Ferrara Strauss um, and Rodrigo Corral. And uh, it's basically the idea of um, a child consuming, like, you know, the idea of being eaten up by your child, but also sort of like the mix, mixed feelings and the, the power of, like we were talking about, the mother-child dynamic. Yeah. First of all, how are you doing? Good, I'm fine, <laughs> <Good>. hot. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, uh, the, one of the questions I had, I'm a writer, I'm actually releasing my first debut poetry book this winter. And it's funny because it has similar themes <laughs> like the lady oh, really? in that book, which was very interesting to me. But one of the questions that I have for you, I'm, I'm young, I'm just getting started. And I wanted to know what was one of the biggest challenges you've come across when writing fiction? Because I know that I want to be writing poetry for a little while, but I'm taking my time before I dive into my first fiction and world building that a little bit. So I'll be writing poetry for a little while, but what was your biggest challenge when it came to writing fiction, you know? I That's think, a loaded question. By yeah, no, no, I think, it, but it's, you know, in my case, because I had written fiction early on, but then I went and I, and I really trained, I, I started writing screenplays. And screenplays are very much blueprints that don't have, like, they're the opposite in a way of fiction. They're just like skeletons. And they lack all the sensory smells and tastes and all that stuff. So I had to kind of learn how to slow down and 
just, you know, really try to give the reader a full experience. In a way, I think being a poet is a wonderful basis for being a fiction writer because that's where, you know, that's really where the line to line, image to image stuff happens and you, you know, it, you have a better chance of being a really, I think, a good writer. I, I had to back into that and find it. Um, so I understood really more story and then I had to kind of back into the fleshy part, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, that helps out a lot. I appreciate that. And um, one thing I noted down that you mentioned that, I don't know, is something that was really important was finding form for your characters. I found that just statement profound. So I appreciate that and I'm taking notes. So yeah. Oh, great. Well, good luck. I'm excited to read your poetry. Hi, um, I kind of came in a little bit late, but I'm just, I'm just curious, like, I, I know very little about writing, but um, and you might have already answered this, but which is, what comes to you like first usually, like world building, characters, a conflict, an idea, do you, which, or does it, is it just like? What's she asking? Uh, what comes to you first, characters, world building, conflict? Okay. All right. Character, I'd say I start with character. Okay. Um, almost always start with character. And then, you know, the characters eventually, if you're true to the characters, eventually the characters collide and then you have conflict, especially if it's in a family situation. And then you also, of course, have internal conflict. Okay. Um, and sometimes it's as easy, like, it's, it's like, it's sparked by, you know, there's one story in the collection called Receipts, and there's an assault. And that assault was something I was carrying around for a long time. And how do I tell, the, you know, the story of that assault? And then I gradually found the character that was gonna, that it happens to. Okay. And so, like that. Okay, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Hi, you've sort of, sort of touched on this earlier, but um, can you, do you feel, or do you see a relationship between your film process and your writing process? And has either of them, you know, really fed the other, or is it a constant layering, or how, what, what's that like to be doing both of those so intensely? Well, the film and the writing, you know, it's interesting, because, I think because I'm so p deeply a writer, I do think about writing as a kind of model, even in film, like I write my own films generally so far, I'm always looking, but I haven't found anything. So I always write my own films. And then in a way, you know, when you cast the characters and you cast the actual actors, that's a kind of rewrite right there. Like you immediately said, boom, you know, it's gonna be this person. All of a sudden, the person you originally imagined is gone and now you have this person. Then they speak and every, you know, people talk about improvisation and I think all acting is actually improvisation because you're saying it differently every time. It doesn't matter if the words are different. So that's a kind of rewriting. And then when you edit, that's a kind of rewriting. So in a sense, I guess you could say it's all writing, but not necessarily writing by me. I mean, there's a lot of loss of control in filmmaking, which, and, and, and it's obviously much more collaborative. Um, and so in that sense, but I do find that they're, they're very linked and very different pleasures. On the occasions when I've adapted my own work, I've, actors have taught me a lot about what I, I wrote. They've taught me a lot because they have these deep insights that, you know, because they're living as the people. Mm -hmm. So that's also fun. Cool, thanks. We have one over here. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess how much, of, how much of the stories were written during the pandemic and did that have any impact on the stories? Say that? Say. How much of the stories were written during? Oh, during the pandemic. Um, how much of the stories were written during the pandemic? Well, a lot of, like four or five of them Three of them were finished during the pandemic, and one of them was entire, two of them were entirely written during the pandemic. Chekhovians, which is the last story in the book. Um, but Vapors, I had been working on for years and finished during the pandemic. And I Want You to Know was written during the pandemic, although, as I said, I was carrying around this sort of heart of I Want You to Know for many years. So the, the whole, um, and I kind of went into all the stories. And it's true, like many writers, I think, I was forced to sit and 
be isolated. And, you know, I was with my family, but I was pretty isolated. So that helped writing a lot. Definitely. Hi. You mentioned how some of these stories are built on bones that you've been kind of carrying around for many years. And I wonder how it felt to return to kind of a past self as embodied in the written word, like both stylistically and emotionally. Um, thanks. Say that, yeah. Uh, the stories that you started a longer time ago and you came back to, how did it feel to oh, yeah. get to come back to that past To come self? back to them. Yeah. Well, in some ways, I felt like I was able, especially with vapors, where you know that was something where I had taken notes many years earlier, and I had no idea. I really had no idea to tell the story, and it was, it, you know, I was able to. I think partly also because of distance, and I was able to sort of, and 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 just having done it for a long time and gotten better at it, you know, I was able to sort of see how to do it. So in some ways, it was nice because I felt like I understood my craft better and was able to kind of understand certain things that I couldn't understand. So it was kind of like I created some raw material in some cases and then was able to mine it or something or like fashion it later. It was really interesting. It was a very interesting experience all around this book. Um, yeah. Did you find yourself needing to have kind of empathy for where you were as a person when you started those stories? Yeah, I feel like I did have more empathy for I do. I feel like, yeah, I feel like I had more empathy for myself. And also I'm, I'm struck by some of the stories, you know, when I read um, Mrs. Covet, for example, I thought of that as a very cheerful story. And recently I reread it and it's really dark and terrifying. <laughs> and I thought it was just this comic little romp. I realized it's like, it's sort of horrible. It but ends I mean, with a felony. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. No, I mean, it's like the worst nightmare. But I didn't remember it that way. And then, you know, you, um, yeah, I think I often have a sort of perception of myself as sort of much sunnier than perhaps I actually am. But yeah, so it was like, I definitely did feel like I had empathy for myself as a younger person. And I was also like playing around with memories of myself as an even younger person. Because although, like I said, this is not autobiographical, but it is like the concerns that I had when I was 15 or 16. You know, the things that I was, that I remember thinking about and going through. Um, you know, there's one girl in, in um, uh, the Chekhovians, there's a girl who, who says to her mother, you know, most people in the world are actually dead, so the living are the exception. And it's sort of like these kind of, you know, and it's these kind of way. Of, I remember having these thoughts that were these these kind of, I don't know, ruminations as I was lying on the driveway, which I actually gave her this girl like the tendency to lie on the driveway to, but yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, we have someone. Right here. Hi, uh, I'm just talking a general question about short stories. In general, uh, I'm used to reading o, o. Henry style of short stories. They always end up with a, a big bang in the end. You know, you, you expect the story to go somewhere. There's a sudden revelation and you're like, wow, what an ending, you know. And then when I come to other modern short stories, I expect a similar kind of, you know, I go through the story, I like it, and then I'm expecting something to throw me off. And th that doesn't always happen, you know. So I don't know if it's something that's in the back of you as a writer to end the story in a way, you know, you give that emotional impact. Is it something that we carry all the time or is it something that it's, it's changing with modern short stories? You know, you, you don't really get, sometimes the story ends, you don't even know it's ended. You're still hoping something else to, you know, follow the story. Right, so we're talking about O. Henry story, reading O. Henry stories, and the, the fact they that end. they have a surprise, like the Ending, twist. Yeah, it's a lot of twists that happen. You know? And you feel like short stories now have that, don't have don't that as have much. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, not, I guess that does happen a bit in, the, in this collection. There are twists yeah. where you sort of are like, oh, aha. So, yeah, I guess I do like to do that personally. I, I think I know what you mean. I mean, I like stories that are almost like... I mean, my question is, is it at the back of your mind to do that, you know, as a writer to... Do I have it in mind to do yeah. that? Yeah, I think I, I think I do like to do that. 
I think I do like to do that. It's almost like there's a punchline sometimes. It's almost like that you come around and you, it, it, you know, I think that the funny thing about short stories as opposed to novels, I've always thought that they were the most metaphysical form of writing because, well, not, maybe not compared to poetry, but I don't know as much about poetry, but I'd say that with, with the short story, because they don't have the same kind of sense of responsibility that a novel does. Like you read a novel, it's a real investment and it's got a kind of like, the chickens have to come home to roost, you know? I mean, at the end, whereas a short story can kind of lift off and the best short stories, it's very hard to define, but it's like they just lift off at the end and you feel kind of like you've been taken off the ground a little bit. And you know, there are certain stories like John Cheever's, like one of the great examples, Chekhov sometimes, you know, where you just like, you get, um, it's, it's, it's like some, some kind of chemical thing happens and you can't, I don't know that you can control that, but that as a, as a short story writer, I think you're always going for that. Right. And it's very hard to define, but I think it's a little bit what you're talking about. Yeah, I just see the difference between the old short stories and the new ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. I keep seeing the difference, yeah. Right, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a couple minutes left, so if no one else has a question, I am going to be self-centered and ask my final question. Okay. <laughs> well, you, because you mentioned in there when you were talking about your writing process that you had a bad bout of writer's block years back, and I'm wondering how did you get over it? I ended up volunteering in a women's shelter in Dublin um, because I was living in Dublin. My husband, we were there and I, had, I didn't know anyone and, I, and I, I didn't know what to do. And so I ended up volunteering there. And basically the solution was taking my eyes off myself, hmm. not thinking about myself. Um, I didn't do it for material, definitely not but I did write a short story um, that was about that experience, which was um, in the short story uh, collection called Personal Velocity. There's a story called Delia, which is I, I set in the United States, but it was definitely about my experience of working in the women's shelter. And that came, happened you know, some years later, but I, that, that was, yeah, so that, that was, I think that, that, that what happens with writers is like if you, it's like you, you just, look at something all the time and it, 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 it squirms, it can't flourish. You, you have to kind of let it happen over give it there. Some, give it some air. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so, okay. Well, no other questions? All right, well, it has been an honor. It has been just a pleasure to read your work and then to get to talk to you about it. Thank uh, you so, so much for this wonderful Of course, uh, everyone let's Thank hear it for you. Rebecca Miller. Thank you.